Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, We are going through a series on just revival, and what it means, what it is, what it's supposed to look like, I guess what we're supposed to anticipate. Um, just to review, it's roughly like five stages, not necessarily that these are prescriptive, but these are usually the five what does stages. What prescriptive mean? In other words, this isn't like mandated that you got to go What's through this. What's mandated mean? Commanded. It's not somebody bossing you around telling you this is the way it's got to be. Thank you. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> you have five phases that I guess if you can look through historically, observation-wise, um, that a person uh, goes through, or even like if it's in a well. A group group of folks would go through, you can say, uh, before um, I guess revival transpires or happens. Uh, first of which we'll be dealing with today. I'm just going to give a quick overview of what we talked about, and that's basically the five phases. Uh, one is there's got to be something more. Which we'll address today, and then after that is when somebody's looking for something more, then usually they start doing something about it. Or at least the yeah, person that's concerned about it. there being something more. So what they'll do is they'll usually go ahead and they'll uh, start seeking God at that point. So seeking God, and then phase three would be God has come, or whenever God you know, actually commun communes with you, or communicates with you with regard to uh, your seeking his presence. Uh, and then fourth would be brokenness, and then that's the pathway to blessing. And what that is is basically, um, usually there's an obstacle to you being in close fellowship or close union with God. And so what he's going to do at that point is he's going to point out something that has been lacking or something that needs to be, you know, oh well, either something that needs removed or something that has been lacking that needs to be implemented in your life. And then at that point it's like, okay, you have a... Uh, a choice to respond either to the positive, which would be agree agree with God and then uh, accept His um, that's where I'm for. <laughs> accept His His uh, mindset on the on the issue, or you can as what would be normal, um, which wouldn't be recommended, but it would be the normal common flesh response would be you get mad, you usually most people get mad at God and then they just kind of like do their own thing. And then final phase is basically <coughs> life again, and that's where God's actually actively working, and then you are in close, close uh, fellowship with him. And then he's not just within and working your life, but working through your life to affect others. And that, that's what would be... Well, technically, I would... <laughs> technically, I guess, if you want to look at it, revival would be when you are individually, like, as far as drawn close. So at that point, it'd be okay. But as far as where you are affecting others, and then that's what usually people most commonly think of that being revival, when it's like you got the, the greater effects, but technically really would be as far as when God renews your life or works in your life. All right, so we're starting off with there's got to be something more. There's got to be something more. Go to the book of Genesis real quick. The book of Genesis. What book was it? Genesis? Yes. Um, we'll be in chapter 5 and I'm 
Really, you can skip down to about verse 17. <coughs> or verse 18, I'm sorry. Verse 18. We'll skip down to verse 18. And then it says, And Jared lived an hundred and sixty and two years, and he begat Enoch. And Jared lived after he began after he begat Enoch eight hundred uh, years, and begat sons and daughters. And then all the days of Jared were nine hundred and sixty and two years, and he died. And then verse 21, And Enoch lived sixty-five years, and begat Methuselah. And then Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah uh, three hundred years, and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were three hundred and sixty and five years. And then Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And then verse 25, And Methuselah lived in hundred eighty and seven years, and began Lamech. And then it's going to go through a genealogy. The beginning of the chapter basically is uh, generations of Adam, and then it goes basically genealogies of starting from Adam, working its way to at the end of the chapter would be Noah. So it's a genealogy listing of uh, from Adam to Noah. Um, now you're wondering, like, why am I addressing this? Why, what does this have to do with revival? Um, Enoch lived 65 years. Now, granted, their lifespans were a lot longer than what ours are right now, so that would seem kind of odd. Okay, 65 years old, you have the kids. And then um, what it says of him is that he had his child at 65, and then after he had his child, uh, basically he started walking with God. And then we know of his testimony from Hebrews 11 where that God took him because he was faithful. So he had a, he had a, a strong enough walk with God uh, after he had begun walking with God that God, for whatever reason, decided to go ahead and take him. Uh, one of two people that basically didn't see death on, in, as far as physically <coughs> in this lifetime. Uh, the other one would have been Elijah when he was taken up with the chariot where he watched the song after they crossed over. And then, um, but it says of him, he was 65 years old, he begat Methuselah, and then after that he began to walk with God. Now this is going to be to some point conjecture, but why would that be a, something to make note of in Scripture? Why in the world would that even be noted as to... Because Methuselah lived to be almost 900 and some years. And so it made a difference in his life because his father was walking with the Lord. Okay, that... Well, um, I, I guess let me clarify your question. <laughs> Why... What's the big deal with Enoch walking with God? Because, I mean, he... Okay. All right. It's a big deal for anyone to walk with God. It takes a lot of time to really know God. So no, I'm not trying to lead or trick anybody here. You can just, I'm just. Oh, I mean, he's part of the generational line. I mean, that's one of the things that's being traced here. And so. Would it be I guess what I'm trying to find out. No one would not like, have known God. Yeah. You know? Without. Wouldn't it be almost like the time of Noah, where they they were um, people were doing things they shouldn't be doing constantly, and they weren't thinking of God at all? And this is something unusual, just like Noah. Okay. <clears throat> yes, in part. Um, it's a big deal for you to walk with God, and it's a big deal that Enoch walked with God because, I guess, in a sense, without his testimony, without his walking with God. It, I mean, it, you could say it would have affected us even as far as today. Uh, you wouldn't have had a godly line. Um, now, it's interesting that he started walking with God when he had Methuselah. Because prior to that, it just says he was. He was born. And he lived 65 years. And then from that point forward. Now, that's what I mean by conjecture as far as did he walk with God before that? Mm -hmm. I assume he, so. Yeah. He may have. We don't know. <laughs> it's not noted. It's not specifically stated. But it, usually, 
it's point out it's pointed out that he began walking with God basically at 65 after he, and then he walked with God for 300 years after the fact. Uh, so he lived 365 years, um, and then he had, you know, well, he was taken. So he didn't actually he didn't actually get to die. Uh, he began many sons and daughters, not just Methuselah. But um, the point with this is that one, it's important for us to walk with God. There's other examples we're going to look at. Two, um, it does affect down the road. Uh, I don't know how long the Lord has, not only just for us to be around, but also for this generation to be around. He could return literally today, this afternoon, uh, this morning. Tonight, tomorrow, uh, at any given time, uh, we're not told when. We're just told to be looking forward to his coming in, in anticipation of that. But should he tarry, it, he should tarry for another generation or two. Um, how we walk or how we pursue the Lord and how close our fellowship is with him will affect not just, obviously, us individually, but uh, those that we have a sphere of influence or within our sphere of influence. So there are people that would be affected as to whether or not they would be drawn close to the Lord or they would have an example or be motivated to walk with God. Or, uh, two, also that I wanted to point out, I guess referencing back to the fact that he started walking with God or the idea as far as that he started walking with God after he had uh, Methuselah was, now this would be the conjecture part, is that you could say, well, not that he didn't have anything to live for necessarily, but you have the stark reality of that, well, I have this great grand responsibility in a child. That doesn't mean that, you know, you can't walk with God as a single person or you can't walk with God as a young person. Uh, you know, even as a kid, if you know the Lord, really, <laughs> all you need is a personal desire to want to draw close to him and to walk close to him. Um, but I guess the stark reality of the fact that there is something more to live for beyond just me. Um, usually that comes with responsibility, but it isn't limited to that. And so um, he began walking at that point forward when he noticed that, when he came to that realization. Uh, our first steps in wanting to draw an eye to God or having a walk that is a lot closer and what it is presently basically starts when we realize, look, there's something more to life than just what it is that I'm presently living for. Um, and that you can fill in the category with whatever. It could be, you know, you could be, <laughs> you could, well, all right, well, relationships. You can put in whatever relationship that you want to. Those could be an idol. You could make, even though you wouldn't have necessarily a uh, like a little statue like you see maybe at a, a Chinese restaurant the cat or the Buddha that they put you know um, food offerings in front of uh, but the, the person it's, the person themselves could be an idol to you as far as they would be of higher priority than your walk with the Lord um, and that would be misplaced um, you can have your job would be one another that's pretty common here in the US that we see a lot uh, which I've been guilty about, that, uh, that it has higher priority in, you know, what your commitment level is to God's program and God's plan, which would be, be the local church. Uh, you can, you know, video games for some people. Uh, <laughs> Football. <laughs> I was going to say that. Sports would be another one that would be for some people, actually. Uh, I, the, I'm, I'm laughing because there was a meme that I saw of um, this huge, I guess it would be like 9 to 30 foot um, trophy, Super Bowl trophy, that was being paraded around. Um, and it's all a picture, right? It's like a drawing. But what they had done was they tried to replicate the image that you would kind of get from uh, Daniel in Daniel 6 whenever uh, Nebuchadnezzar had uh, created a big old <coughs> statue of himself that was 
where when they came to the day of presentation that everybody was supposed to bow down and they had the trumpets and the cornets and everybody that was playing and then they were supposed to go ahead and bow to worship. So you have this scenario, this image where these men are all dressed in what would be, I guess, period dress for what would be considered back there in that time. Uh, in kind of like what you would see in the little Sunday school um, flannel graphs. And then what you, uh, I think the, the caption read something along the lines of uh, when you ask your friends, well, you know, what, are you coming to worship with us? It's like, no, we're already worshiping. And then they're parading around the Super Bowl, <laughs> the Super Bowl trophy. Anyways, it's, I, for me, I found it humorous. It's not, probably not that funny, but that could be <laughs> something that would be an idol to some. Um, you, there's any number of hosts of things that you can put forth and look to and have an idol. Anything that basically has priority over your walk with God or your relationship with God over what God has basically instituted for your life in a sense really just counts as idolatry or really constitutes idolatry. So getting back um, you drawing nigh or you wanting a closer relationship there's nothing hindering in the sense of it's a choice that you would make. Uh, the realization that there is need for a closer relationship usually comes about when God is working or prompting and saying, look, this either needs to be withdrawn or this needs to be implemented. It, and it could be a number of series of things. But coming to that realization is usually our, is really the first step and that's uh, what uh, needs worked on. With Enoch, it came about when Methuselah was born. Uh, that's not to say he didn't walk. He may have walked consistently, but what we read in Scripture is that he be basically he began walking. <coughs> or excuse me, uh, verse 22, and Enoch walked with God after he began Methuselah. Um, the idea seems to be that he didn't really walk before that. He may have known God, but as to how close or how important or how much of a priority that was for him uh, prior to that, you know, again, conjecture, we don't know. It may have been, but he may have been very consistent. But at this point, whenever he realized there's something more to life there's, um, beyond me, then he began walking. And his walk was close enough that God took him. Okay. Go to New Testament. We're going to go to Book of Acts. Book of Acts. Mm -hmm. All right, go to chapter 10. That there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, uh, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day an angel of God coming to him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodges there with one Simon a tanner, uh, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And then when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called uh, two of his household servants and devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And then when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. Now, the, basically, the rest of the chapter is going to be the account of 
the men arriving at Joppa, finding Peter, and then Peter at first being, <coughs> well, Peter prior to the men arriving at Joppa would be addressed by God in a dream regarding clean and unclean animals. He would see a sheet open and then he would see uh, various animals that would be clean per Levitical law and then unclean. And then the unclean animals were presented forth. Uh, Peter was hungry and then God told him, rise, you know, kill and eat. So go, go get your food. And then he, this would happen about on three separate occasions within this time frame prior to, this men, to the men arriving. And you have Peter given the same response, which was not so, Lord. You know, in other words, <laughs> I can't do that. You know, you know, this is against your law. Uh, considering that you are the one that instituted the law with regard as to what would be clean and unclean for me to eat. So he would wait from that. Men come there, and then he realizes, oh, I guess this is what God has been uh, trying to address with me, address me concerning the dream of the unclean and unclean animals, because uh, he was still a little bit somewhat prejudiced and he didn't want to really deal with Gentiles. But he goes ahead, goes on anyways. They bring him to Cornelius. He's able to. Sh uh, Cornelius shares with them what basically had transpired as far as seeing his vision within the time of day. Uh, the ninth hour after had, having being devout in his prayers and such in his alms and what the angel had told him so he said he perceives that this is the grace of God he shares with them the gospel uh, and then he and the people that were accompanying with him uh, get saved as far as company with Cornelius so now you have Cornelius and a group of Gentiles that are there get born again and they begin speaking in tongues as confirmation to Peter, saying, wow, okay, they have the Holy Ghost as we would. And so in other words, I perceive God's not a respecter of persons. You know, he's able to save unto, basically unto the uttermost. All right, so now you're asking, how does this pertain? And then one, this guy's not even a born again man. So how is it that he's seeking revival but he doesn't even have life to begin with? Okay, the pattern still followed. He saw he had a need. He was devout, so in other words, this man was somebody that saw himself as being needy and in need. Uh, he was actually aware enough that he saw that God is the one that is to meet his needs. Now, he didn't really have a good clarification as to who the true living God was, but he had enough awareness that, okay, I know God is real and he's responding to what like he had concerning God. So. He would pray, and he was called devout. So he would be somebody that would be religious. He would be something akin to, say, I don't know. I guess anybody that would be religious nowadays that you would see. Um, I try to be, I try to be careful with this sometimes. It's easy to go ahead and bash and knock because of the false doctrine, the false teaching. Um, but there are a lot of people that are trapped that really don't know any better. Uh, it's not the case with everybody. I mean, I guess it takes a matter of just communicating with them and discerning as to whether or not they're genuine or they just blinded themselves because they have a hatred towards God. But there are people, um, most of my personal experience as far as like with dealing with cults or other, other faiths has been primarily with Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, a lot of what they do uh, is because of the false teaching that they've been under. Um, they're, in a nutshell, basically a workspace salvation that they denied the deity of Christ. So that's been the point of contention, or the point of argument, or point of discussion, whatever I've, as far as that's my personal experiences with them. Um, but they genuinely are taught and believe, as far as the genuine, the sincere ones, you have to work for your salvation. And even then, you're not really, it's not really guaranteed necessarily. So a lot of what they do with going out on the Saturdays and trying to uh, proselytize or you know, trying to get people as far as converts is as a result of, I don't want to go to hell. <laughs> if this is what they're telling me, I need to be able to go to heaven, I'm, you know, obviously. So if you really wanted to go to heaven, wouldn't you do that? I mean, seriously. <laughs> but, I mean, we don't have to because, of what God's, because we know God's truth. You know what I'm saying? But the fact is, that's that's a work that they believe, okay, that would be before God as something that 
you know, I need to do is necessary for me to be able to go, and so, um, or be able to get in, to be able to get access or entrance into heaven. So they do that, among other things, as far as, you know, just they're just, they're just following blindly what they've been taught because they don't really know any better. And it really falls on us, believers, um, that know truth, to challenge them, to confront them on that. Uh, again, not in an egregious manner, not in a mean-spirited way, but they're given over to lies, they're believing lies, you know, and if they could die in that condition, you know, what have we done to go ahead? You know, God has made very plainly, very clearly, very easily the way of salvation. Uh, it's by faith in Christ alone. And so for us to go ahead, you know, for whatever reason, hold it back from, you know, that's, that's wrong. We, should, we ought to be a lot more proactive as far as reaching out. All right, all right here's the point. Um, I got off a rabbit trail there. All right. Um, Cornelius was responding to the light that he had with regard to what he knew of God. And then God, in turn, responds to him with regard to that, sends Peter to him, and then he, when he is confronted with regard to salvation, what where salvation, you know, basically what salvation is, it's not, it's not a means of work, uh, but it's by the grace of God. It's by faith in Jesus Christ alone. He receives it. And then boom, you know, he gets born again. So he receives life. Um, again, this is a little different because this is from an unbeliever getting born again, but the pattern still followed. There's something lacking. I need something. So he seeks, and then God is going to respond. Okay. Um, go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Start at verse 16. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, uh, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Uh, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed uh, from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Uh, therein, as far as in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed. And then um, verse 18 For the wrath of God is revealed. From heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, or restrain it, restrain the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. Interesting. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being made, or seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. Uh, and then he goes on to explain here, they are excused, one, because even the things that may be known of God, the invisible things, uh, as the Bible term here is Godhead, what we would normally refer to that would be the Trinity, with God, God, you know, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, which is <laughs> hard to explain, but the fact is, it's real, uh, the triune God, but it's manifest in us. And God says it's very clearly understood, being understood by the things which are made. It says, verse 21, because that which they knew, or excuse me, because that when they knew God, uh, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, uh, but became vain in their imaginations, and were foolish, and their foolish heart was darkened. And then, uh, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image uh, made like unto corruptible man, into uh, birds, into four-footed beasts, and creeping things. And then, wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, uh, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And then... Um, he goes on through. He gave them up to, he basically gave them up to their passion, to their lust. So the darkening process started at 
when they knew God, they glorified or not, they either were thankful. So their unthankfulness and then the, their, their refusal to glorify God, which was glorify basically means to lift up, but the idea is that you're, you're refusing to acknowledge God for who he is. So you're refusing to acknowledge the fact, okay, God's God. You know, most people would think to themselves, well, who is God? As uh, Pharaoh or even Nebuchadnezzar had at one point in his life. And they would say, well, I'm God. You know? um, the, the darkening at that point was they refused, they were not thankful, so he gave them over. He let them, he, um, how do you put it here, as uh, he not only gave them up, uh, but their foolish heart was darkened. It's like if you reject light, what alternative do you have? Basically darkness. Right. That's the express concept with there's got to be something more. Right? There's a lacking, there's a longing, and when there's light shown, pursue it. Uh, when you reject light that's offered, you really don't have an alternative except for darkness to turn to. I mean, all you have is truth, which would be God's truth, and everything else would be lies, be it from the world, the flesh, or the devil. So when God is affording graciously his light and his truth, response to it will bring a closer or a closeness, or in other words, he'll, he'll draw an eye. You draw an eye to him, he's going to draw an eye to you. But you reject light, then it's, you don't really have any alternative. I mean, all you have is darkness to turn to. So you end up basically in darkness. Um, okay, go to Ecclesiastes real quick. Ecclesiastes. Begin verse or chapter one, verse twelve. Uh, chapter one, verse twelve. Well, you, verse just beginning verse one. I'm sorry, chapter one, verse one. Okay, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. This is Solomon speaking. Uh, vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Uh, what profit hath a man in all his labor which he taketh under the sun? One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. The sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteth to his place where he arose. The wind goeth toward the south, and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. All the rivers run into the sea, and yet the sea is not full into the place uh, whence the rivers come. Uh, thither they return again. All things are full of labor, man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with longing, or excuse me, with hearing. Uh, the thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done uh, is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new? It hath already been of old time, which was before us. Okay, there is no remembrance of former things, neither shall there be any remembrance of the things that are to come. Uh, with those that shall come after. Then uh, verse 12, I, the preacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom uh, concerning all things that are done under heaven. And then this sore travail uh, hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. Uh, and I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. And then he's going to spend basically the rest of the book. Uh, well, <laughs> it's going to say complaining. He's not really complaining necessarily, but he's coming to a realization. His viewpoint is that of what would be 
a man under the sun. So in other words, if you're looking from life as a human perspective without God involved. And his conclusion was that I've seen all the works that are done under the sun and behold all is vanity and vexation of spirit. So in other words, what's the use, what's the point? Life really doesn't have any value. It's uh, vanity. The, the uh, word is hevel and the idea with it is it's like a vapor. It's short-lived. It's here today, gone tomorrow. It has a very short time span on it. And vexation of spirit, that basically which causes you trouble in your soul. So life is nothing but trouble, and there's not much to it. There's not much time to it. What's the use? Okay. Um, at the end, obviously, he gives he, he gives us, I mean, it's not like it's a depressing book that's, that doesn't have any value. His conclusion is, at the end, uh, <coughs> chapter 12, verse 13, he says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Uh, for God shall bring every work uh, into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Right? And then he spends out, so chapter 10, uh, chapter 11, chapter 12, primarily chapter 12, regarding um, serving God, seeking God now. And, uh, remember now the day, uh, thy creator in the days of thy youth uh, is his point. And then he goes on and gives a description as to why that's the case. When we get older, our body is going to de deteriorate and basically we're going to die. So with what short amount of time that we have, with what energy that you have, with what uh, resources that you have, uh, pursue God now is his conclusion with regard to this. All right now you're saying, okay, why did I bring up this? Um, if you just look at life apart from God or you look at life just for the living, you're going to come to the same conclusion that Solomon did, which was this is pointless. There's no use to it. It's very short-lived, even if it is fun. And the fact is, there's a lot of trouble. <laughs> All right, there's a lot of pain. There's a lot of heartache involved in it. Um, but life with God is different. Okay, it doesn't mean that you're not going to have trouble. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have problems. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have pain. Uh, it means you're going to have purpose with it. There's value in it uh, that is beyond here. There will be eternal value. And you're going to have, beyond that, grace of God to be able to meet those trials, to be able to have that satisfaction for the longing that we all cry out for that says, okay, what what is it to life? All right. Um, does anybody have any questions? So, this week then, what do we do to start preparing for revival? Okay. It's a good question. All right. What we need to do, uh, I would start off, me personally, recommend, make an inventory. Because you know, if you're honest with yourself before God, what you, an area, or maybe multiple areas would be, that you feel would be lacking. I would set aside time, uh, I would purposely set aside time uh, on a daily basis where you can just be alone with God, um, <clears throat> where you can just be uninterrupted in your thoughts. Um, what I mean by that is, I usually like where it's quiet. Um, personally, I have multiple areas. Personally, I don't like to have people around, so I don't have to worry about being distracted. And a lot of times I even just be in my car in a parking lot somewhere that's pretty much empty where I don't have to worry about, you know, or if I can be like out at the beach at night or something like that where I'm not going to have to worry about somebody accosting me or something like that. Just somewhere where I feel like I could be like, <laughs> I know, whatever. I mean, I'm not trying to be like weird mystical, but I'm just saying, I'm, those, I'm, just, I'm just saying as an example, you don't have to do that wherever for you, but I'm just saying, okay, where you can get inventory, where you can just be alone. And you can be with God and then ask God uh, specifically, okay, you know, reveal to me or show me areas where I am either lacking or I, or I need, or, you, or I, you know, help me, I need help in 
this or these areas. Okay. Um, I'm going to read this real quick. You guys don't have to turn there, but Proverbs 1. Uh, I know this is a silly question, but you guys know what a purpose statement is? You guys are well, okay. In other words, that's a statement telling you the purpose for something. All right. Proposition. All right. What it's all about. Yeah, okay. All right. Most of your books within the Bible themselves have like a proposition or a purpose statement to them. In other words, they were specifically written for this reason to address this or to address that or to address a person, uh, as the case may be. Uh, I personally like to go to Proverbs, but it isn't limited to this. But in Proverbs 1, uh, basically the first, uh, first six verses give you the purpose. Actually, verse 5 isn't necessarily a purpose, like a prescriptive purpose. It's just an um, example, not an example. It's basically an, explain, it's an explanation of, okay, what would happen if somebody were to actually apply with the, what's taught in there. But uh, it says, Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. Purpose one, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding. Purpose two, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity. Purpose three, to give subtlety to the simple and to the young man knowledge and discretion. And then purpose four, in, in verse six, we're skipping over verse five, but uh, to understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. And then verse 5 is, A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. So in other words, that's what happens to somebody that applies the word of God. In other words, they'll, they'll be enriched by it. Uh, but Proverbs is specifically written, you could say, to, to teach these things. So if you were to just be limited to, I mean, I'm not saying that, because I mean, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. But this particular book is written, you could say, as a blueprint for life. So if you wanted to be able to understand, okay, how life functions according to God's design, that that's where you want to go and you want to start out. All right. Not limited to that exclusively, but I'm just saying. So you want to know, okay, what do you want to do for revival? Where do I start out? I start out, okay, book of Proverbs. Okay, God, what do I need? What am I lacking? You want to be able to... I would recommend some place that you would be alone where, okay, God, you can communicate, where you can just pray to God, and then while you're reading, you can be uninterrupted, and then he would point something out, or point multiple things out, as the case may be. All right, does that make sense? Does that answer your question or no? Yep. Okay, that's, that's what I would recommend as far as from starting out. Um, you want, if you find yourself where you're needing or you're lacking you want God to be closer, start pursuing Him. In other words, and where we start, where I would recommend is in the Word of God. Uh, I would personally recommend Proverbs for that reason only because that's a purpose statement that was given for the book. It's written expressly for that purpose. And if that's what I need, I mean, we're better to go. Uh, again, not limited to that book only, you have the whole other 65. But that's specifically written for that. All right. Did anybody have any other questions? Okay, really? No? All right. Uh, next week, we're going to be addressing Seeking God. Um, get handouts for you for this week and also for next week. Um, this coming week. All right. No questions, okay, we're dismissed.